All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Poplar Homes webinar about Las Vegas evictions during the eviction moratorium and uh, the resulting legislation that came out of the eviction moratorium for the Las Vegas and Henderson areas. Today, we've got a great uh, webinar in store for all of you. We're going to be talking about everything from how evictions work in Vegas and Henderson areas, and also what are the impacts of the moratorium, as well as what are the biggest pitfalls that we see landlords making during evictions. This is an important topic as we are all very well aware of evictions and how costly they can be for landlords. And it's important to get it right. Uh, one of the reasons we wanted to put this on is that we've got uh, a great guest on board that's going to be helping us present this information. And that is our real estate attorney and partner from Las Vegas, Nevada, Donna DiMaggio from the Holly Driggs firm. Uh, Donna, welcome. And thank you so much for joining today. Thank you, Chuck. And you're right, this is an important topic and it's certainly uh, been in the news uh, quite a bit, not only in Las Vegas, but nationally. Absolutely. Uh, it's something that we know, you know, uh, landlords, especially those in Las Vegas, are concerned about making sure everything they're doing everything right when it comes to evictions. Um, one fun fact is that out of all the states in the U.S., uh, Nevada evictions is one of the highest uh, search terms on Google. Uh, so that indicates to us that, you know, there is a lot of concern from landlords in those areas. Um, maybe the complexity of the laws and the process uh, is, is higher than other states. So I'm glad we can get in here and, and kind of clarify how things work there. So we'll, we will jump right into it. And today we've got some uh, visual aids here that we'll run through and I will shrink myself down a little bit. And this will just be a conversation with Donna and uh, learning about the evictions. And then at the end of this event, um, depending on the event that you signed up for, there may be an opportunity to ask audience questions. And you can do that right within the Zoom chat. So throughout the event, please go ahead and use the Zoom Q&A feature to submit your questions. What you will learn from this webinar, like I mentioned, how the eviction process works, why do they happen, uh, what is the impact of the eviction moratorium and the, the most recent legislation? And then what are the biggest pitfalls that landlords face when doing an eviction in Las Vegas or Henderson? We've got our great guest, Donna here, who I just introduced earlier. So uh, Donna has been uh, named as one of the legal elite by Nevada Business Magazine in 2010, 2011, and 2018 specializes in real estate evictions in the Las Vegas and Henderson areas. Uh, Donna, thank you so much, so much once again for joining us. Is there anything you'd like to say about yourself? Introduce yourself to our audience today. Uh, well, I've been practicing law for over 20 years, so uh, I do have some, <laughs> some familiarity with Nevada. I've been in Nevada practicing since 2006. Um, real estate and evictions obviously has become a very uh, popular area given um, the state of the pandemic. And uh, like everyone else, uh, staying on top of everything since it's been an, an ever-changing area lately. And thank you for, for having me. Absolutely. I appreciate the opportunity to help um, both Poplar and all of its clients. Great. Well, I'll... Thank you, Donna, for that background. Um, as you guys have heard, Donna is a really a specialist when it comes to this, and uh, she's been our go-to when it comes to any kind of eviction or real estate-related legal issues in the Las Vegas area. My background, that's me. I'm Chuck. I'm the co-founder and CMO here at Poplar Homes. Uh, we are a tech-enabled property management service. We serve and manage over 2,000 doors, homes, all across the West Coast, including California, Washington, Nevada, Colorado, uh, and more states coming soon. Without further ado, let's get right into things. 
So first, we're going to talk about how evictions work in Las Vegas and Henderson, Nevada. And Donna will walk us through the formal eviction process and uh, the nuances of that process during the pandemic. First of all, why do evictions happen? This may be an obvious question, but it's always important to remember what are the reasons that evictions happen? It's obviously not a good situation to be in as a landlord and definitely not as a tenant. Uh, it's something that goes on a tenant's permanent record. It can be a very contentious and emotional situation. The landlord, uh, as, a, as a landlord, you are very concerned about the um, income as well as the maintenance and sort of uh, safety of your property and your home. Um, and so a lot of landlords are worried, what are the signs of an eviction and, and you know how to handle it? So evictions happen for a variety of reasons. Uh, first of all, non-payment of rent. This is the biggest you know, reason that uh, there's a very clear reason that you need an eviction. It could also be violation of lease terms and the tenant causing a nuisance with other renters um, or a landlord has personal intent of using the property. And I'd like Donna to maybe comment on that last one there, but Donna, is, are, there, are there any other reasons why evictions happen or that you see um, people facing an eviction? Um, no, just a subcategory within the, the nuisance that also um, encompasses any criminal activity that a landlord might learn their tenants are engaging in. So that would fall under there. Um, and landlord has a personal use. I mean, pretty self-explanatory, right? Landlord feels like now it's time for me to move into my own home um, and do that. Or uh, uh, contrary or uh, on the flip side is maybe the landlord wants to sell that property and no longer wants to own it. Um, so that would cause um, the landlord to, to need to evict the tenant. Absolutely. And that, and is, is, you know, in California, I'm, we work in California and Washington and their eviction rules, you know, uh, there are some cities where um, there's no such thing as no cause evictions, but is that, also the case in Nevada, or you, can you evict for no cause at all? Nevada does have no cause evictions. It starts with a 30 day notice for a, a no cause eviction. So it's a little bit more um, time given to the tenants than the other basis for um, vacating. Uh, but we do have a no cause, which is the, it's first the 30 day, uh, notice and then followed up with what's called a five day notice of unlawful detainer. Um, and once those two periods of time pass, then the, the landlord can file a complaint for eviction. Got it. So it's a little bit more landlord friendly of a state than maybe some of the very strict states as uh, California or Washington. But as far as the whole country goes, would you say Nevada is? Or, and specifically Vegas and Henderson, are those more renter friendly or landlord friendly uh, when it comes to evictions and, and maybe just general landlord tenant law? I, I think generally Nevada, like most states, are is more tenant friendly. Um, a lot of notice requirements, timing requirements to give tenants as much notice and opportunity to um, fix the situation before they, they actually have to be evicted. Um, I will say that during the pandemic, some of that dynamic has changed and it's really gone back and forth depending on what period of time we were at during the, the pandemic. At the very beginning, it was the courts were very much so leaning towards the tenants for obvious reasons. Um, mm -hmm. And then as time went on, it, it became a little bit more uh, friendly towards landlords. And I'd say currently it's probably 50-50. Landlords and, and tenants kind of sharing where the courts are going at this point. Got it. Well, what about when it comes to signs of an impending eviction situation? So, obviously, you know, signs of an eviction um, can be your tenant is habitually late in paying the rent or they're missing payments. There's an increasing rate of complaints uh, from your tenant about how high the rent is or other problems at the property that, and this often combined with you know lease violations or or late or missing payments um 
increasing rate of HOA violation notices, or just generally, you know, violations of the terms of your lease. Um, Donna, you know, as a landlord, how can you sort of watch out for um, a possible upcoming eviction? Is there any other signs that, um, you know, you want to you want to look out for? No, that that pretty much covers it. I think the the biggest one is if you see that your your tenant is habitually late or missing payments, they're obviously having difficulty um, paying the rent. So that's usually the first red flag that goes up um, for a landlord to know that there's going to be an issue. Got it. Yep, that makes sense. I, I think also to that end, um, you'll when you. When an eviction is impending, um, the landlord will probably notice that the tenant stops communicating with them altogether in time at times too. So the opposite yeah. of sometimes there's increased complaints, like all of a sudden the air, the air conditioning isn't cooling the house as much as it used to, or now there's bugs that they never saw before. And then conversely, they just won't communicate with the landlord, which is what um, a majority of the landlords found during the pandemic. Um, and when the moratorium was first um, put in place, saying that tenants should work with their landlord, landlords should be willing to enter payment plans and some sort of agreements, but landlords were then seeing that the tenants just went radio silent and would not communicate with them in any way. Um, and so that's, you know, those are some of the important signs to look out for as a landlord. Um, and yeah, as Donna mentioned, sometimes, you know, once in a, once there's some kind of contentious relationship between you as a landlord and a tenant or your property manager and tenant, communication can be difficult. Um, so, you know, as best as possible, try to keep communication open or, or pursue the legal route. So let's, if you do need to go into that legal route where you're gonna be doing an eviction, um, you've obviously got to follow the right process, serve the right notice. So Donna would love you to walk a landlord, you know, a landlord through sort of what is that formal eviction process versus a summary eviction process um, for Las Vegas and Henderson. And obviously there's a lot of steps to it, but from a high level, what are those, um, those big steps? Sure. So from a high level, before we go into the, the two different types, um, I'll go back to the notices that are required for the different specific types of evictions. And it, uh, we should note that these rules apply across the state, not just specifically in Las Vegas and Henderson um, or Clark County. So the, the, state, the state statutes are, is what governs the eviction process. What will change sometimes is there are slight differences in some of the forms and notices that a landlord will need to file depending on what court they're in. Um, for instance, Las Vegas Justice Court has their own specific forms um, that slightly, ever so slightly differ than the, the forms you would you would file with the Henderson Justice Court. But as far as the law goes, everyone's following the same law. So we discussed the different types, of course, non-payment. Um, when there's been a failure to pay rent, uh, the first notice you, you issue is a, what's called a seven day notice to pay or quit, meaning you give the tenant seven days to come current with their rent or vacate the property. Now, seven days is also calendar days. Uh, strike that. Not It's business days, not calendar days. So um, you don't count weekends or holidays. So even though it's so it's technically a little bit more than seven days, but you just you only count business or, or court days. If the, if the tenant fails to either pay their rent or vacate, then you, you can file a complaint for eviction um, right after that period is, is over. For a violation of the lease, say um, they have an animal that was not approved they have visitors that are staying longer than 14 days, those types of things, what's required is, is a five-day notice. Again, you wait the five business days. After that, you then have to serve what's called, and we mentioned it before, a five-day notice of unlawful detainer. So this that's a two-step process. After that period of time expires then, and the, the tenant has failed to vacate, 
the landlord can file the complaint for eviction. Um, also, we discussed the, uh, the, a nuisance violation, which includes subletting and assigning um, criminal activity, operating an illegal business, um, and um, drug use and, and things related to um, drugs on the property. That requires a, a three-day notice um, to correct the violation. And then after that, the three days expire, you then also file the five-day unlawful detainer. Once that period ends, again, file the complaint for eviction. Uh, the last, we discussed the no cause, that's a 30 day notice followed up by a five day notice. And it's obviously self explanatory. No cause means no cause. It, I, you know, I, I just want my property back. Don't need to give a reason, really. You, you just want your property back. Um, last is in a squatter situation where you've got some unauthorized occupant in the home that has never had a lease and does not have a right to be on property, uh, you serve what's called a four-day notice to surrender. And then after the four days expires, you then follow up with, again, a five-day notice of unlawful detainer. If the squatters are still there, you file a complaint for eviction. So those are basically high-level review of the different types of evictions. Once you file a complaint for eviction, you have the landlord has a choice whether they want to have a formal eviction or what's called a summary eviction. So a formal eviction, the, the biggest difference, well, there's a couple of differences. The first, the biggest difference is in a formal eviction, the landlord can um, sue for any back rent in that same case. So if there's unpaid rent, and it really doesn't depend. It really doesn't matter how much um, justice court is up to fifteen thousand um, dollars, and so if if it's under fifteen thousand dollars, then you can file the formal eviction and ask for those damages. Uh, versus in a summary eviction, you do not get to sue for back rent that's owed. You have to file a separate action once the eviction is complete, um, and typically depending on the amount, you would file in justice court or, or small claims. Um, or possibly district court, depending, you know, if, if it's a, a larger than $15,000 as owed. Um, the benefits of, of choosing a summary eviction is, is a very, it's a quicker process than if you go through a formal eviction. So a formal eviction is almost akin to a trial, and you'll have the same steps um, when, when going into a formal eviction as you do for, for a trial. There'll be a full-blown hearing, evidentiary hearing. Um, you'll have uh, evidence, documents, exhibits. You can take testimony. Um, so it, it, it's obviously a, a much more lengthy uh, process. Again, the difference is you can then sue for your back rent. In a summary eviction, you file the complaint for eviction, attach the notices and the proof of service of said notices. And it used to be within 30 days, you would have a hearing with the judge if the tenant answered or if the tenant didn't answer um, and there was no response, even, even quicker than that, within a week, you could have um, an order for eviction. I will say even, well, not earlier in the pandemic because obviously it was it was stayed, but uh, now that things have have kind of ramped up again, in a summary eviction, I have been I have been finding that in Las Vegas Justice Court anyway, in a summary eviction action, if the tenant does not respond, uh, the court is is issuing the order fairly quickly, usually less than thirty within thirty days, um, and sending the order to the constable. So. That's and that's uh, Donna on that point. When you say the uh, the the courts are issuing the order, but the tenant doesn't respond, is that um, you know how many times does the tenant have the opportunity to respond? Uh, and you know, do you see a lot of tenants just going unresponsive? Or there are certain cases where you see tenants be more unresponsive than others. It really doesn't matter uh, on the case. I would, in, in my um, experience, when a, a, a tenant's going to file a response. Um, uh, Pre-pandemic, um, 
the process is if once you you receive a notice from the landlord, um, uh, the tenant can first file a response to that notice. Um, and then when the when the landlord files the complaint, it's filed into that action and it gets set for um, hearing. If it's for non-payment, it would it would go it would also go to mediation. Um, what's changed now since the pandemic and the passage of um, AB 486 in in Nevada, um, it is mandatory now that a, a, an eviction for non-payment goes to mediation, uh, where it used to be something that was um, an option between the, the landlord and the, and the tenant. It is now mandatory, um, and I would and. I would say because of AB 486, there has been an increase in responses from tenants, mainly because it allows the tenant to now claim what's called an affirmative defense, that there is a pending rental assistance application. Um, that's something that was not available prior to the pandemic and prior to for AB 486. Um, and so if, if the landlord files a complaint and the tenant files a response, stating that they have a pending rental assistance application, then the eviction needs to be, or must be stayed until a decision is made on the application. So given that new change in the law, there has been, um, in my experience so far, an increase in the amount of times a tenant actually responds to a notice or a complaint for eviction. Yeah, yeah that yeah. makes sense. Well the uh sorry go ahead were you finishing your I, thought i was just going to say in the cases where um the tenants do not file a response and it the judge issues the order for eviction grants the eviction and issues the order a tenant still has the opportunity to um, what's called stay that eviction if they file a motion for stay within 10 days of that order uh, being issued uh, so th there is an opportunity to, to still come back and and fight or or challenge the eviction should the the tenant not initially respond. Got it. That makes sense. Well, even if the tenants are more responsive because of those those um, rent relief applications, you know, hopefully that also means that the the landlord's going to get paid, you know, some of that rent back through those. Um, those rental relief funds. So um, yeah, that's that's definitely interesting. And that brings us to the next point, which is let's talk about, you know, specifically you've you've touched a little bit on the impact of the eviction moratorium uh, in Las Vegas and Henderson and the AB 486 bill. Uh, and so I just want to kind of dive into that a little bit. Let's talk about what is going on with the eviction moratorium in Vegas and Henderson. Uh, is there any impact at, at all? Because you know, I know it, it, it had already ended uh, earlier than you know a lot of states. Um, I think it was back in what was it May or June that the sort of official moratorium had ended. May thirty first. So in Nevada, the the state moratorium ended May thirty first. Um, okay. At that time, the federal moratorium was still in place until June 30th. Um, so what we were finding here, at least in Las Vegas Justice Court, which is where I, I practice mainly in for the evictions, um, the, the judge would determine whether or not the tenant was using what's called their best efforts, because the law stated from the CDC moratorium that a tenant had to make their best efforts to make payments or arrange to make payments or um, at least communicate with the landlord about the situation. So once the state moratorium ended on May 31st, if the judge found that the tenant was not making their best efforts, they, would, they ruled that the federal moratorium did not apply and the state moratorium applied, and since it had ended, they would the judge would grant the eviction. Now, fast right. forward, um, we now have the extension of the well, we had the extension of the federal moratorium, 
Um, and in between the time that the federal moratorium was extended, Nevada passed AB 486. And uh, we touched briefly about what AB 486 does. It allows the tenants to uh, some time to apply for rental assistance. And in that situation, um, the eviction is stayed until there's a, a, deter a determination on the application. If the tenant is approved, then the uh, funds go directly to the landlord. And then the landlord cannot evict for non-payment for 90 days. They have to agree um, because now that in all essence, the landlord has been made whole and there's no rent that's, that's due. Um, if the uh, application is denied, obviously the landlord can move forward with, with eviction. Uh, this did not apply to uh, evictions based on nuisance. So a landlord could still evict for nuisance um, situations, subletting, uh, criminal activity, things like, things like that. Um, and also during the time once AB 486 was passed and the federal moratorium was extended, it was supposed to go to October 30th or 31st. Um, some of the landlord, or some of the judges, however, did not um, rule that the federal moratorium was even applicable in Nevada because we now had our own law that dealt with um, rental assistance and getting the rental assistance out to tenants and, and landlords and tenants. Um, my understanding is the federal moratorium had been extended to allow that time to get the money to the states to then disperse to the landlords and tenants. There was, there's been, was some backlog obviously. So they were trying, to, that was the reason why they extended the moratorium. Given that Nevada already had their law passed regarding rental assistance applications, some of the judges didn't even think that the federal moratorium applied. At this point, it doesn't really matter because we all know the United States Supreme Court uh, ruled that the CDC moratorium could not be extended um, through the president. And so it is, it is now no longer in place. So like we were before, Nevada is, and their judges are, are relying on AB, the language of AB 486. Great, so, that, so the vote by the, the federal courts is really didn't have impact on the state legislation or, or how the rules were being interpreted. It's um, because that law is in effect. And is this, um, you know, our, our landlords finding that accessing, I mean, we've read a lot of headlines, right? There, that a huge chunk of the rental relief funds nationally has not been distributed. Is that just because there's actually not that many tenants that were in default or is it cumbersome for the pr process of getting those funds distributed and for landlords to go and um, get their applications approved? Uh, what are you seeing in, 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 in that process? Well, I think so here in Nevada last update, there was a, between 800 and 1,000 application, a backlog of applications for rental assistance. Uh, I don't think it's because there aren't tenants that are in need. I think it's because you know the states just don't have the capacity and whatever agency is is handling the rental assistance applications they don't have the capacity to um, handle this this many applications i think that's what the problem has been um, i know you know tenants i i had a case a tenant applied in February or March and still hadn't received an answer as of the end of August. So, um, you know, it's a double-edged sword for the landlords because they can't do anything while that application is pending. But if the application gets approved and the landlord gets, you know, paid all of the back rent that's owed. So although it, it might be taking some time, at the end of the day, it makes more sense to let the process play through because it might it might get the landlord paid. Um, the other thing that changed here in Nevada when they first uh, rolled out AB 486, they could you could only have the tenant apply for the rental assistance. As of August 1st, uh, landlords could then 
um, file their own application to get the process started, even though it still goes through the tenant. So um, the landlord can can file the application, but it'll, it will re revert back to the tenant to complete. Um, it's not something that the landlord can just do on their own. Um, in either situation, whether it's the landlord filing the application or the tenant filing ap the application, um, whatever uh, amounts that are approved go, does go directly to the landlord. So there's no um, kind of fear that the funds are not going to be used for what they're allotted for. That makes sense. And I'm, I'm very curious, like for in, the, in that example where there's a backlog of 800 to 1,000 applications to get rental relief funds, what happens in that period of time between, you know, March 2021 when someone was approved and August it's still not approved? Are those months going to be covered as well with that same application or do you need to go resubmit? My understanding is those months will be included so that you don't have to go through the process again. Um, that is my understanding. Now, whether or not that's happening, I haven't, I don't know yet. I haven't seen it one way or the other um, because it, it's, it's, it hasn't been that many that applications that I've seen that have taken that long. Um, so far, but um, there are there are ones that are taking that that long. Yeah. Um, but my understanding is it will it will go to when it's finally um, approved because the landlord has to verify what is owed anyway. So say the tenant applied in February and they don't get around to it until August because of the the number of applications, the landlord's going to fill out that information of how much. Uh, back rent is owed um, and so it should be to the current day or month. Got it, got it. And, and so on that note, I mean, uh, how can landlords, you know, get rental assistance from these rent relief funds? What are the different options that are available to them? Uh, you've, we've talked a little bit about, you know, the CARES Act and I think there's an, a new name for that act now. There's CHAP. Uh, how do how does a landlord access these and sort of initiate the process to get those those uh, relief funds or um, at least attempt to do it in order to move forward with the evictions? Right. So everything is available online um, and various websites. I mean, even if, if you just Google Chaps or, or rental assistance in Nevada, um, the information comes up. Um, there is a phone number. Um, 702-455-4071, um, which is dedicated landlord portal for um, once applications are pending through CHAPS. Um, I haven't quite called that number, so I don't know if it's helpful or not, um, but the easiest thing is to just go online and, and apply. Um, and that's for help with rental assistance that will go through the tenant. Nevada did have Oh dear God, that it did have um, help with uh, mortgage assistance. However, that program has been suspended. Um, I assume it's because they've uh, reached the maximum funds they have to distribute. I don't. I don't know that for a fact, but that has been suspended here in Nevada. Did you see any landlords taking advantage of, or I mean? Are there situations where landlords could use the Paycheck Protection Program or the PPP program to, you know, I know that we're sort of past that, but was that happening during the pandemic in Vegas? I, I did not see any landlords specifically um, apply for PPP loan to cover um, a rent kind of situation. And I, I guess honest, if they, yeah, they have I don't property know management they, staff, maybe that that, that, would, that might be, but I, I didn't see any specific landlords. Um, no. Got it. Okay. So uh, I guess the final thing, so we've talked a little bit about, you know, how the eviction process works. You know, you, we've got the, the notices and at the end of this webinar and presentation, we will provide everyone uh, a copy of sort of the flow charts of 
what that formal and summary eviction process looked like. Um, you can, uh, and that'll be something you can get in touch with Donna to learn more about. Um, but let's sort of close it off here with talking just about sort of what are the biggest pitfalls that landlords make during eviction? You work with, um, you know, tons of landlords over your 20 plus years experience, I'm sure. And you've seen, uh, you know, the, the, the most perfect and seamless uh, sort of eviction process and one that's just totally jumbled and, and, uh, and results in, in big risk for loss for landlords. So yeah, I guess let's go through some of those pitfalls. And um, the first one you told me about was not knowing specific language and all the statutes. So I'll let you sort of elaborate here and jump through them. I've got three here that you gave me, but yeah, right. I'll so, hand it to you. Uh, the landlord tenant statutes in Nevada, they're located at the Nevada Revised Statutes, um, chapter 118A. Um, and there's there's a lot of information in there, even before the pandemic came and 486, AB 486, you know, changed it. So um, if you if you're not you know familiar with the language and, and what the statutes require, you may miss something. So earlier I talked about what notices need to be sent or served on the tenant, depending on the type, non-payment, nuisance. It also determines on one of the, one of the factors is how long the tenancy is for. So if it's a month-to-month -month tenancy, you have certain timelines to to serve a tenant. If it's a if it was a week long or, or a weekly situation, um, where some, there's a lot of those weeklies here in in Las Vegas, especially. It's a whole, totally different timeline on when you when you have to serve and how much notice you have to give to allow the tenant to vacate. So, you know, there's there are different nuances that you need to be aware of. Um, adding to it, that's probably one of the ones that most landlords don't know. Um, the landlord can't just serve these notices themselves. It either has to come through a constable, a process server, or someone from a law firm. Um, and, and then service is defined uh, how, what types of service is defined in NRS chapter 40, which explains the types of service. Sometimes it has to be personal service. Sometimes you can post it. Sometimes you can just mail it. Sometimes you have to do all of it. Um, during the pandemic, we were doing all of it, despite what the statute said, just to make sure, you know, the judge couldn't go in and say, you know what, I think you probably should have done this instead of this. Um, so in order to, to cover all our bases, I advise clients to just do it all, personally serve it, post it, mail it, do it all. Um, so that's, you know, that's another, that's another area. Um, again, since the pandemic in AB 486 and even before AB 486 with the different um, um, kind of rules or laws that, that our governor was, was putting out um, throughout the pandemic also changed what needed to be contained in the notice. So say you served a seven day notice to quit or pay rent. It used to be you just served the seven day notice to quit and pay rent, got the form off the website. Uh, in the middle of the pandemic, you then had to also include a sample CDC declaration and explain what those were for. Um, after this period of time, uh, once the Nevada state moratorium ended, uh, the, the notice now required the landlords to provide information about rental assistance and how to find and apply for rental assistance. So those were two different, uh, you know, one wasn't a law, one was just the proclamation from the governor. Um, AB 486 was something else. So unless you know where to go, you wouldn't know that all of a sudden new language and new information needed to be contained in the notice you served your tenant. Absolutely. Yeah. I remember we, when we were serving, um, you know, three day or five day notices to pay or quit, we basically had, you know, a lot more paperwork that we had to include with that notice. We had to have a form that the tenants could fill out and submit back to us stating their reason for non-payment or if it was COVID related. Um, and, you know, even some areas that, you know, childcare costs, uh, that was also a reason for people to, to get out of it. Um, but yeah, that there is so much paperwork that was like additional required in those notice packets. 
And without them, there was, you know, basically very little grounds we had to stand on to pursue any kind of resolution. Um, and so, you know, those, if, if you're a landlord sort of self-managing your properties um, or trying to do this on your own, just make sure that you've got, um, you know, a, a good uh, hand on what is required and a good partner, whether it's that law firm, someone like Donna, uh, to help with serving those proper notices in the proper time timeline, and the whole thing will go smoother and and you know probably get done for less. So and, and especially now, you know that the courts are absolutely you know overwhelmed, and it will most likely only get worse from here. You know, if a judge can see that you missed a, a notice, it's very easy for that judge to to get rid of, rid of that case off its his his or her docket. So yeah. Um, no reason to to chance your 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 eviction because you missed you know small amount of language that should have been included in a notice. Yeah, and that brings me to one just final point here, uh, Donna, which is, are there just real quick? Uh, is there a difference with how hearings are being done in the Vegas Henderson area, depending on um, the judges that you're working with? Um, is there any? Any advice that you know landlords should be aware of with that? Well, you know, the biggest change is most of them are now most judges require that um, it's virtual. So on Zoom or in in mm -hmm. Clark County, it's called it's called Blue Jeans is the is the application. Um, so that's obviously the was the the biggest change, um, and not only just in eviction cases, but just in all cases, civil cases generally. Um, I believe criminal cases also went virtual, but I don't, I don't dabble in the criminal world, so I'm not entirely sure. Um, for a while, it was mandatory that everything was virtual. Um, right now in justice court, at least in Las Vegas, it's an option. You can request um, the court allow you to appear uh, tele telephonically or virtually, and they, obviously they have been allowing that given the situation. Um, the other thing that changed, and I think we talked about it earlier, is because of the change in the laws, because of the change of the circumstances with the with COVID, um, you know, judges were kind of changing how I don't want to say they were changing how they rule because the law is the law, but they now had different tools to use whether or not they were going to grant an eviction or stay in eviction. So things were for for a bit a little bit um, more difficult, which is why you know I mentioned that I advise clients to just use every type of service uh, when you're serving a notice so that when you go into court, you can tell the judge you, you did it every single way. And that would be one less reason why the judge would deny your eviction. Um, so that, you know, they were stricklers for um, the rules, which I mean, they were before too, but they certainly were making sure that everyone was dotting their I's and crossing their T's before they would allow um, an eviction. Now that we have AB 486, it, it is slowing things down a little bit because everything has to go uh, on a non-payment case. Every, it has to go to mediation, um, but it, it it hasn't been entirely um, too slow to get a case through. I mean, like I said, if if a tenant didn't answer, they're still pretty quick to grant the eviction if everything's in in line. Um, but it, it it is adding. The fact that we have to go to mediation on all non-payment of rent evictions is, you know, adding another step and slowing things down a, a bit. And then fast forward, even though, or even when the eviction is granted and the order goes to the constable, I think that is where we're seeing um, a significant uh, increase in the amount of time a constable can get to the property to lock out the tenant because they are absolutely 100% overwhelmed right now. Um, so you, it used to be you could get a constable there within 24 hours after re receiving the order. And it, it's it's taking sometimes up to two weeks to get the constable out to the property because they are just, you know, they're not prepared. They just don't have the staff or the funding to um, handle this amount of of evictions. Yeah, yeah I'm sure uh, that position is sort of facing the challenge that many businesses are facing with staffing and and just people you know people being overworked, sort of pent up demand for 
everything, including uh, eviction orders. So um, that's, you know, that's something to take into consideration. Make sure, again, you've got a good partner. And on that note, I mean, how can a landlord get help with an eviction, Donna? Um, you, you yourself work with evictions, um, but is there any advice you have for landlords who are looking or maybe in need of someone to help with that process right now? Well, I think the, the first step is to ha hire a property manager. Um, they, they know the laws you know, just as much as an attorney does. Uh, and will be that buffer for the landlord and, and the tenant. Um, most of the property managers, including Poplar, will then come to an attorney like myself when it has to go through a full-blown eviction or there's an issue that the, the, the property manager can't handle or shouldn't handle um, and the landlord needs advice. So that, that would be step one. Um, it just makes everything a little bit easier for a landlord, especially if they have multiple properties. It also makes sense to have um, a property manager that has counsel uh, to work with for a landlord. Great, yeah, and I, what we always see is, you know, at the end of the day, um, as a landlord, you know, adding in those extra sort of buffers of, of liability and also people that can just focus on that one task, whether it be tenant screening at the very beginning so that you're getting a good tenant that's not gonna be an eviction scenario, or in the worst case that there is an eviction scenario, just making sure all those steps are handled in a timely manner, especially if you're out of state or um, unable to be full-time with your property. So exactly. uh, get in touch with the manager. Um, well, thank you so much, Donna, again, if you guys, if anyone here is in need of sort of uh, consultation, talk about your specific situation, um, we're working with a great site, nvevictions.com has some good information on that website about evictions in Nevada and specifically Las Vegas and Henderson. Uh, reach out to us through that or uh, through Donna as well. well, we'll provide our contact information and just have that initial talk um, sort of a uh, free consultation with Donna to determine is she the best to work with you uh, and yeah and uh, we have been working with Donna in Nevada area um, getting us set up to be able to handle all of these different uh, curveballs thrown our way during the eviction moratorium and Donna I mean do things look like in 2022 that you know things will calm down or are you expecting a lot of business to just continue to pick up through the year, through that year? Well, uh, yeah, that is a good question. AB 486 is in place until 2023. So I anticipate that we will have the same process going through 2022. Um, whether or not there'll be the volume that we're seeing right now, I think the volume will certainly um, lessen. Um, but we will be going through the same kind of process at least until 2023. Wow. Well, you heard it here first. Uh, AB 486 is in is the way business is going to be done until 2023 and and possibly beyond. Um, you know, I'm, as sort of legislation works, once precedence is set, um, it sort of paves the path for future legislation. So. Thanks again, Donna. You've given us a great rundown on how evictions work, how the eviction mor moratorium is impacting Las Vegas and Anderson, and what are those biggest pitfalls, how to avoid them, how to prepare yourself properly as a landlord. So hope everyone learned something from this webinar and please go ahead and put your questions below. Uh, Donna and I are going to go and switch into our Q&A outfits <laughs> and uh, come back with uh, a live Q&A to answer questions um, if that is available for this event that you registered for. So go ahead, use the Q&A feature on Zoom and submit your questions. And we will uh, try to get to as many of them as possible. Uh, once again, check out nvevictions.com or Poplar Homes and both have great resources. You can email us marketing at poplarhomes.com 
we will provide all the slides and materials from today's webinar, as well as put you in touch with Donna should you need it. So Donna, thanks again so much. And uh, let's go do the Q&A. Thanks. Thank you, Chuck. Appreciate thanks, it. Yeah. All right. Stop recording.